Hello, I'm Kansi and Chengwai Fixer. Today we have this Tiger pinwheel calculator, uh, which is kind of interesting because it's actually made in Japan. Um, I think by the, based on the serial number, this is from the early 1930s, um, which is kind of interesting because usually, you know, at least in this country, we don't see Japanese stuff that old. Um, generally, you know, the the mass importation of Japanese products in this country didn't really start until like the late 50s, early 60s, um, as far as I know. I don't think much was imported before that. But anyway, this is kind of interesting. Um, so this has a few fancy features on it. Um, you can see it has the quick clear for the registers here. So instead of having to turn the crank all the way on, you just pull this lever and it just does the clearing that way. Uh, this one is kind of sticky. So he doesn't want to spring back, so I have to either clean the oil or maybe the spring is broken or something. Um, this does have uh, tens carry on the counter register, and you see because that it has this switch for uh, multiplication and division, so this will determine whether the counter counts up for addition or counts up for subtraction. Because um, normally, without the tens carry here, you just have you know, when this turns backwards past zero, it'll just show red numbers. If it turns forwards, it'll show white numbers. But because when this turns backwards past zero, it, you know, does the underflow, this all changes to nines. Um, you have to change this over to uh, division, so having to do subtraction, it won't go backwards past zero. It'll actually count appropriately. Um, it does have the input register, which is nice. Uh, of course, input clearing here on the side. Um, and the carriage tabulator, which is another one of the issues. This is pretty sticky, so the carriage really does not want to move. So that has to be looked into. Um, also, these are pretty sticky. It really doesn't want to set numbers. And some of these don't want to move at all. You can actually see the whole pinwheel cylinder is moving when I try to set that. Um, so if we do one operation here, two operations. So this brings us to another issue. You can see now we've got blank, 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 zero, two. Now if I release this and turn it forward, now you hear a click and um, show the appropriate number there. So that's because this right. I'm not sure if you can see, but this crank is loose on the shaft. So I'm moving this, you know, a good distance, and the pinwheel cylinder is moving a little bit, just as much as I can hold it. So that has to be looked into. Um, input clearing works though. That's nice. Of course, this does work, but it's just doesn't want to return. So um, take the covers off and see what it looks like on the inside. So I think it to be pretty uh, dirty with old dry grease clogging everything up. Um, I'm sure if I'll show this whole this assembly sequence because I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but I'm not even sure how this cover comes off. I'm assuming it's probably more screws than usual because it has this extra lump for the uh, input register there. Um, I'm actually not sure if this is the first Japanese main calculator. Um, these are the only ones that I know of that are this old. I think uh, Buscom also made pinwheel calculators in Japan, but I'm not sure exactly when they started. I don't think they started in the 20s. It actually started in the early 20s, I believe. It's also interesting to see you know, how close this, internally how close it um, Matches with you know, Brunswick and the other European manufacturers. And it looks like there's two screws in the back here. As far as I know, these were not you know, normally exported to the U.S. I think that all the ones that are in the U.S. were you know manually brought in by individuals, not you know exported as a as a business. I don't think.
see if this will come off. Well, almost. This is actually this is bent. It looks like that's why we can unbend it. Or we're just gonna break off. Hopefully, we can just unbend it slightly. So I have to fight with this for a little bit because it doesn't look like it wants to cooperate here. Let's see if that works. There we go. Okay. All right. And so first glance, this is way overcomplicated. There's your little transmission there. Oh, just didn't see that much complication in here. Um, Pinwheel Center doesn't look bad. This must be a lot of dry grease in there, I guess. Um, probably gonna be taking the register off next. Yeah, look at that gear train there. I wasn't expecting that much gear train in there. Of course, this is not gonna be there. I think that's the home position. That's another problem too, because this is so loose on here, when you lock this in, there's no guarantee this is in the home position, so things don't necessarily always work, but it's pretty cool. All right, so let me take the carriage off next. Usually there are just locks in either end, which actually I don't see here. So I'll have to look into figure out how this carriage comes off. So let me do that and we'll pick back up then. I took the bottom plate off. Um, it's just this piece here. Uh, you can see what's left of the feet kind of just mushed out like that. Um, so might have to figure something out for that. Um, you can see the carriage won't come off because this is in the way of this cast base plate. So let's see if we can soft this screw. Most of the screws come out, this one didn't come out, so we just uh, broke the head off of that. And now I'll have to figure something out for that later. Let's see if this will come out. Now also down in here I found this, which looks like a broken bell clapper, so I have to see what that goes to. See if this will come out conveniently. So I'll also take this screw out too. Okay. Not coming out very nicely. Let's see if we'll get some of these pieces out first then. This looks like it does not want to come out, so I have to play with this a little bit. I wanted to take this out, but it's my hand is right in the camera, so that doesn't do anything. So I'll see if I can play with this and come back after that. Well, after a lot of pain and frustration we got somewhere, I still can't get this plate off. Uh, I thought that by taking, undoing that mechanism I would be able to pull this out the front, but no, you can't. Because if we put this up here, um, so this piece has these pieces pinned to it and it has these long pins on, so there's no way it could ever fit out the front. Um, this carriage plate can't slide out because it has this pin in it. Um, which is the pivot point for this piece. Um, and I don't know how that comes out. I tried twisting with, with, with vice grips and got nowhere, so I'm guessing that's staked in and doesn't come out. So I have no idea if you even can get this out. Um, however, this is just a plate that the actual carriage frame here screws to. So is a bunch of screw holes in here that screwed onto this plate. So by taking out all those screws, I was able to get this off at least. Um, interesting, I'm not sure what that's from. Uh, so at least I got that out. Um, but I still would like to get this plate out to fully clean up the rails and get this out to fully clean this up. Um, this wouldn't come out either. That was held on by these pieces here, um, 
I like pivots on the side there. I thought that by getting that out, I had an easier access to get this because when I first started playing with this, this was like this, and then this had it trapped in, but no, that didn't get me anywhere either. Um, in order to flip the machine over to work on it, I had to take out the uh, shift fork here because if you flip the machine over, this gets bent down, which I'm guessing is how it got bent. Somebody flipped the machine over and it rested on this and bent that down, so I um, had to take that out. But the screw for that is directly underneath this shaft, so I had to take the, um, luckily the bushings are screwed in, so I took the bushings out and I was able to move the shaft back. The shaft actually won't come out because this fork here, which um, was held in by a set screw to the shaft below, uh, I thought about that by loosening the set screw this would be able to slide over so you could slide the shaft over and get it out, but no, you can't. So that shaft won't come out. Um, and of course, when I moved it back, it disengaged and all the numbers spun around, so we'll have to line that back up when we put it back together so that they all say zero when all the levers are at zero. Um, but anyway, so we got somewhere, but I still would like to figure out how to get this out. I'm hoping I don't have to take the entire frame off the base. That would be rather annoying. Um, plus, when you split these, everything just falls apart. So um, we got somewhere, but... Not as far as I wanted to. Um, and while we have this apart, we still can't get that good of a look into what the drag is on this lever here. Looks like there's just this screwed in bushing. Uh, I'm not sure that'll come out. It's probably staked into the uh, gear section. You can see that that, whichever way it goes, this way I guess. It's just a, a geared segment that comes out and it's supposed to spring back, but it does not. So, I have to look into that. I um, have to get this out. And, yeah. So, I have to figure out why these are so stiff. Could have, it could be because this whole mechanism is moving. Uh, they're still stiff even when you. Those are really stiff. So something's up with that. Uh, I'm not sure that the stiffness, these don't feel stiff and these don't feel stiff. So it might just be, you know, gonk down inside the pinwheel cylinder itself. So if that's the case, I might end up, end up having to split these anyway if I have to take this whole thing apart, which I'd rather not do. But we'll see. Um, so I'll keep taking random pieces off, I guess, until I get somewhere that I'm satisfied with and then it can start cleaning. Um, yeah, not what I would call convenient to work on. Uh, I'll just say that. Um, usually in these pinwheel machines, you just take off a, a tab on either side or even just one side, release the carriage release and the carriage just slides right off, but not so here. This is definitely, definitely not convenient. So two things. One thing, I just realized how stupid I was being. Turns out there's a cutout here in the base plate for this pin to slide in. I don't, I don't know how I missed that before. Um, probably because I was trying to take it off the other way. I think every single pinwheel machine I have worked on, I've always taken the carriage off that way. I don't know why. I think some of them will only come off that way. I just never... Try taking it off this way. It comes off this way. So if I didn't have to take out all those screws out of the bottom, the carriage would have come out that way if I just tried that earlier. Whatever. I think this thing can come out now that needs to get cleaned up. Um, this thing, I don't know about this thing. So I don't think this piece comes off. I'm pretty sure that's part of the cast base, I think. So I don't know whether they assembled this piece you know, as one in the machine. Um, pretty sure this won't come out like that. So, I don't know. I can clean that up in there, that's not a big deal. It doesn't really have to come out. I definitely wanted to get that base put out to clean up the rails in here. Um, anyway, thing number two, this pin is not coming out. Um, it turns out it actually fractured. You can see here's the piece that came out. That's why that hole looks empty now. Um, See, so it just 
fractured right off. Um, that pin is rock hard and it's not moving, the piece that's left anyway. You can see there's the end of it. Uh, I tried hammering it both ways, I tried drilling it out. I think I dulled three drill bits so far um, and got absolutely nowhere on the pin. So that must have been hardened or something or it just got hardened over the years, I don't really know. but. Either way, it's not coming out. I haven't gotten it to move at all in either direction. And like I said, I don't three drill bits without taking any material off of it at all. So um, it's not coming out. Um, on the plus side, all the hammering seems to have tightened it up. So now when you rotate this, it stops and you can hear that click right when this lines up. So um, I think what I'm gonna do for now is leave it like that. Um, Maybe I'll flow some solder in there just in case. Um, but really the only solution at this point would be to either cut the crank off the end or cut the shaft and find either a new whole assembly here or find a new crank uh, and put that on. But I really don't see any way that I can get that pin out. Um, whatever it is, it's harder than any drill bits I have. So. Um, that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, I did take the crank off because um, you can see it's a bit rusty, so it was causing it to not engage smoothly. So I'm going to clean that up and then put that back on. Uh, that wasn't too bad to get off. There's a screw in the bottom that surprisingly came out, even though it was kind of rusty. And then the end piece, which is this, just turns off and then the whole assembly here comes apart. So this goes in, this goes in like this, and then this goes on the end, something like that. I'm gonna have to clean that up, the threads are kind of rusty, but that came apart luckily. Um, but I figured out how this comes out, so hopefully I don't have to take this whole thing off the base and have all this gear train just go all over the place. Um, not that I couldn't put it back together again, but this be more convenient to not have to. It doesn't really look that bad. You can see this shaft looks, uh, the brass shaft in it looks really pretty clean. So I don't really think it would be necessary to rebuild this. Um, so yeah, uh, making some progress, but I really would have liked to get that out and put a new pin in there and clean up, you know, whatever got egged out, but it looks like it's just not gonna be possible. So we'll just have to make do with what we can do. I'll probably move on to see if I can clean this up and get this moving freely. Um, I'll probably have to put the crank back in first to hold it because right now she just wants to move all over the place. Um, but yeah, so making some progress, but not as much as I hoped. So with some cleaning and oil, and these are starting to get a little bit better, but some of them are still pretty stiff, like that one, really bad. Um, so I started playing around with this a little bit and it turns out um, the lock for these setting levers that you can't move them while the machine is not in the home position is actually completely different than Brunswiga and I assumed that it was like the Brunswiga one because it has these caps on the end just like the Brunswiga has and the way the Brunswigas worked was they have a a shaft that runs, a stationary shaft that runs through the center of the rotating shaft that the pinwheel drum rotates on. So basically there's two concentric shafts. The pinwheel drum is on a hollow shaft that rotates and then inside that hollow shaft there's a stationary shaft that runs all the way through both sides. And that stationary shaft has a series of holes, one underneath each setting lever. And when you rotate these, the detent, because you can see how it you know, it latches, it has a detent to detent into the a one of 10 positions. Um, on the Wins Vigo, when you rotate this, the detent actually pops out the inside of the pinwheel cylinder and into the holes in the stationary shaft, which means that as soon as this rotates and those detents are no longer in line with those holes, as soon as you try to move one of these, the detent will run into the shaft and stop and you can't move this because the detent locks it. This, however, is different the lock for the pinwheel cylinder is actually this piece right here. So you notice if I pull the crank out, this pops out, which locks these. 
And it turns out if you push this over a little bit, because you can see it doesn't, it's not all the way over. Now, these are about 800% smoother. Maybe not perfect, but you know, with a little bit of more oil and some work, they probably could be. But these are way smoother right now. I'm not sure if you can tell on the camera, but you know, I can feel it. How much smoother these are, especially, what was it, this one or this one? That was really stuck. You know, wanted to, really had to give it a pull to make it move, and now it, it's pretty free, so. So that little bit of extra movement there makes all the difference. So my suspicion is that um, the release is just worn down. Can you even see the crank? Um, it's a pretty long shaft, actually, longer than usual, but anyway. Uh, so the plunger on the end of the crank, as you can see, it has this little plunger here. That pushes on a rod that runs all the way through here, all the way over in the back here. And then that the end of that rod has a, um, what do you really want to call it, but kind of like an attachment to this piece. So when that rod moves out, this piece moves over and locks it. And then when the rod moves in, this is supposed to move over and release it. But my suspicion is that that rod is just worn down, um, you know, from the use of this pin sliding in and out of there. Um, so what I'm going to probably try to do is see if I can bend this a little bit. Um, really the only other option would be to try to either build up the end of this or build up the end of the rod somehow. I'm not sure how I would do that, but I don't think that's adjustable. I can see if there's an adjustment on the back of there, but I don't think it, I think it's uh, pinned into the shaft. But um, So if I can figure out a good way to get this to move over completely, um, it would definitely uh, make setting these levers a lot easier. Um, hope I can do that. Um, yeah, definitely I'm making progress here. You know, before you could barely even turn some of these. I think some of them you really couldn't turn at all. This one's still a little bit stiff, but definitely a lot better than what it was. And like I said, I still have to um, realign these when I put everything back together. Um, I don't do that until after I've finished putting the bottom of the machine back together because um, in order to lay the machine over on its top, I don't want to bend that shift fork. So that shift fork has to go in first and then I can realign and finally install uh, that top shaft. Um, I'm not exactly sure you know, whether at the factory they worked on these upside down or just leaned them back like this. Probably, come to think of it, most of the reassembly, if not all of it, could be done like this. Um, the reason why I flipped it over um, initially was because some of the screws were just so jammed in here that you know I couldn't get a good hold of it laying it back like this. I actually had to flip it over so I could put enough pressure on some of the screws. So, you know, when all the screws are, you know, free and not stuck, it might be possible to be somewhat like this, so maybe I'll try that, but I think this is a nice constellation of screws here. So, um, looks like they all go into this kind of center support. As you can see, there's a center support that runs up through here and has its base there. I'm not sure if that's all those screws are for that, but just a constellation there. So anyway, I'll uh, look into seeing if I can fix this and see where you go from there. This is the back of the machine. Um, this is that piece I was talking about. You can see if I pull the crank out, that whole shaft moves. I just misaligned it. And this piece here, I'm not sure if you can tell or not, but it has a, uh, a shoulder here and a shoulder here. And between those two shoulders is the back end of that funny shaped shaft that pushes on the lever. Not really a shaft, but that funny shaped piece that pushes on the rod that runs through the pinwheel cylinder. Um, so as that moves back and forth, that moves the end of the rod, which of course the rod pivots, so it moves the front as well. Um, you can see there's a screw in it, so I thought it would be adjustable. Um, it turns out that screw just goes through a hole in the middle of the shaft. But what I did was I made it adjustable by loosening off the screw and then rotating the shaft so that the end of the screw no longer lined up with the hole and then tightening it back down. So now instead of 
working as an alignment screw to line up with that hole, it's now working as a set screw, and it just pinches it against the shaft, which so far seems to be working. Uh, if I flip this back around here, uh, you can see that this is now pretty much tight. Maybe it moved a little bit, so I might have to uh, readjust that screw, but it all seem much better. So, definitely a lot better than it was when we got it. Um, I can't tell if that loosened up a little bit, or maybe I just didn't have it all over. Um, I think that's less movement than it had before, so I think we're definitely improving. And these do feel better. Maybe not perfect, but definitely better. Because um, I have no idea you know, how much wear this machine has. Uh, you can see that some of the plating is worn off the tops of these, so it has had some wear, um, but again, that is typical for perennial machines. Um, I'd imagine people that use these every day must have had really thick calluses on the ends of their fingers because, you know, just sitting here working these back and forth to loosen them up um, really gets to you after a while. So if you're on this eight hours a day, seven days a week, well, not seven days a week, well, maybe this time it would have been um, at least five days a week, moving these little tiny pins back and forth. I imagine you must have had pretty tough fingers after a while. But anyway, um, Getting better. So I think what I am going to do next actually is reinstall the shift fork and then realign all these just because this is starting to bother me a little bit. Um, but I think since I shouldn't, hopefully shouldn't have to turn the machine all the way upside down, since hopefully I won't have to take any more difficult screws out of the bottom. I'm hoping I can just reassemble everything just by leaning it back on the back and doing that, hopefully. Uh, so I think I'm going to reinstall the shift fork and then finalize this. And I think then we should be able to move on to the carriage, actually. I really, as of right now, I don't really see any more issues inside the main body of the machine. Like this gear train, doesn't seem like it has any issues. This, of course, is the, right, I took the ratchet out just so I could um, move the crank back and forth as I please, because that ratchet is there so that once you start the cycle, you have to complete it. Um, before doing the next cycle. And of course, this one happens to have a release on the top, but so I took that out so I could go back and forth quickly with the crank um, for testing purposes. So that has to go back in eventually, but uh, for now, um, I'm going to see if I can wrap up this section. Of course, oil all these parts in here, um, but these all seem pretty good. Uh, and of course, the uh, register clear was working fine before, so I don't really expect any issues there, as I'm assuming I assemble it properly, uh, and then we move on to the carriage. Well, there's your exploded view. Um, pretty much everything is off the carriage now. The only thing, things remaining are the um, quick clear actuators. Uh, the reason is because these are held in by a taper pin right here, and looking at those, they don't look so happy. Um, and if I start, you know, hammering on those and kind of mess them up, then they're just gonna look ugly. Um, so I'm not gonna even bother. And they were pretty free. I got some oil in there. I'm not really concerned about that. So there might be some residual dirt down in there, but um, given that, you know, they feel smooth and everything, I'm not gonna worry too much about it. I had to put some oil on that one, but again, they are, they are smooth, so I'm not gonna worry too much about it. So just those left. Uh, this little fork is left that is held in by those three screws. I'm not going to take that out. I can clean it in place. And this rod here is left, and that is just the um, where these springs uh, hook onto in the front. Um, so it doesn't really need to come out. Um, I can clean all that up in place. Uh, so yeah. Um, so I started with taking off the carry trips on the accumulator which usually is something I wouldn't do on a pinwheel machine um, because of how they're constructed, but this one is different construction. Um, usually these things are a machined piece and they have a hole drilled 
from through the top all the way down through the body and then there's a spring down here in the body with a ball bearing um, which pushes up against uh, one of these shafts here, probably this one. So this shaft would run through here like this and then that uh, spring and ball bearing would be pushing up against the bottom of the shaft to kind of detent this in either the forward or backward position. Um, is normally how they're constructed. On this one, however, these are not machine parts, they're actually stamped. Um, first time I've seen that. Um, I don't remember if they were like this in the Brunsviga, um, I think the 13ZK or 13RK, something like that, that I worked on before. I didn't take notice of that. Uh, maybe they were stamped in there too, I don't remember. But usually those are machined, and I don't take them apart because it's incredibly difficult to get the spring and the ball bearing back down inside the body and slide this shaft through. Um, and you know, you've got how many other positions this has, 18, 16, something like that? Uh, looks like 16. So um, that would really be a painful operation that I would not like to do. So that's why I usually don't take this apart. But like I said, this one, they're, they're not like that. They're actually stamped. And the detent operates on this little cutout here. The detent is this thing. So let me put this down so I can demonstrate. So the this piece kind of pivots like this, and then this piece pivots on the bottom like this and kind of hooks in there. So we can either detent, lock it forward or backwards. This would lock forward and lock, or pop back and kind of lock that way. Um, so. Because that's the construction here, I figured it wouldn't be too bad to take it apart, and it wasn't too bad to take it apart. I don't think it'll be too bad to put it back together either. Um, all these pieces and all these pieces go inside this block here, which sits down inside here. You can see the nice outline. Well, you could if I wasn't shot. So the nice clean outline there where this thing sits down in there. And then there's a shaft that runs through this. So if I show in frame. The shaft that runs through this, that runs through the center holes of all of these and all of these. So these are the carry trip detents and these are the digit wheel uh, detents. Um, and these springs here, as you can see are still in there, are the digit wheel detent springs. So you can, not sure if you can see, but down inside that slot there is the end of the spring so that when these guys sit down inside that slot there, they're spring-loaded up with this finger into the digit wheel. Um, that's how that works. And then the holes get these springs, and those are the springs for these. So these go in the slots with the holes, and those springs push them up into the uh, interlock with the uh, tarot trips there. So, uh, definitely a different construction than what I'm used to for pinwheel machines. Um, of course, this is a little bit later than what I'm used to for pinwheel machines. This would be, you know, early 30s. Um, and, you know, the bunch of figures that I have are all, you know, 1910s uh, or before actually, before 1910. Um, so, yeah, definitely interesting to see uh, a different construction here. Um, so clearly this is not a direct copy, at least not of anything I've ever seen. Definitely different, some different ideas at play. Um, so, um, anyway, like I was saying, I kind of started with... I don't have space to put stuff down. I started with taking all of these off, and of course all these gears came off with it because these sit in between those on the same shaft. And when I got those off, kind of looked down in here and saw how dirty this was and how dirty the um, digit wheels are. You can see like on the the spacer there on the top how dirty that is. Right, how shiny there. So um, I thought I should probably go ahead and take all those out too, just to get everything cleaned up. Um, you can see like how dirty. It is in there, and that's the bearing surface that this rotates on, so that should be cleaned up. 
And then when I got that apart, it's all dirty this was, it's hard to take that apart, take it out. Um, and then kind of did the same thing with the uh, counter. You can see this is the counter carry drive and how dirty that is compared to how clean it is on the bottom. So I figured that should probably be cleaned up. So it kind of just went from there until you know everything's out and everything needs to be cleaned up. So um, luckily I was able to get the taper pin out of this piece, which sits right about here on the counter shaft. So okay, that came out, and then same thing for the accumulator. Took, got a taper pin out of this, which sits, you know, correspondingly on the accumulator shaft. So luckily those came out pretty much without a fight. Just hit them a couple times and they came right out. Um, so that was nice. And it uh, wasn't too bad to take apart, really. Um, this is interesting. So instead of the uh, digit shafts, bearing on this brass surface here. They actually have these, which sit in that, and they're like that. And these are keyed, so the end of the shaft actually goes in there. It has a special key right on the end there. Focus. That special key goes right in there. And then when the shaft rotates, that whole thing rotates. So this short focus, maybe. Seriously? So this is the um, the bearing surface, then this whole thing rotates. And then same thing, there's another section here. So you can see when I rotate the accumulator shaft, this part stays still. That's also key. The counter shaft goes into there and keys into there. And then the counter shaft kind of this end kind of has a bearing inside the accumulator portion, and the accumulator portion actually lies on the brass frame. That's also another thing that's, that I haven't seen before um, for these. Usually they just bear right on the brass frame there, so that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, just a few things I wanted to point out. Um, also interesting for the counter, because this has tens carry on the counter, these are the counter carry trips. And they ride on the same shaft as these, which are the counter detents. So they kind of like go in uh, something like that. And then they're both uh, spring loaded up. Actually, no, just the detents are spring loaded up. These are not spring loaded, um, but they're spring detented by this which is just the sort of little spring fingers that sits right about here. And those spring fingers act on this little tab right here so that this can either pop up or down um, on the shaft that runs through here that holds the, these ones here on the front are the gears for the, the intermediate, intermediate gears for the uh, carry. And the same shaft that holds those also runs through these square portions here um, so that they can lock on that. Um, and of course these are the uh, springs for the counter detents. Um, this front piece hooks on this shaft and then this back piece hooks on, it hooks on like this, hooks on the bottom of the detent to spring load it up into the digit wheel. Uh, so these are the counter digit wheels, these are the, uh, these are the accumulator digit wheels rather. These are the counter digit wheels. This I think is a counter digit wheel, hopefully. I'm sure how that got along. Um, shouldn't matter what order these go in. Um, same thing with all the parts, they're all stamped parts. Um, like all these things are stamped parts, so they shouldn't really be, shouldn't really matter. I try to keep them in order. Um, these just kind of fell out, but uh, if you look closely at them, you'll see it has the last digits of the serial number and then the position number. So this is number one. And then if we pick some other random one, see if this has anything stamped on it. This one's kind of dirty, so it's going to be kind of hard to read. Um, it looks like it has a number two on it. Focus. That's number two there. I don't see the serial number stamped on this one, so that's kind of interesting. Maybe they didn't do that on all of them. Um, see a number. 
there might be an eight. So, I, like I said, I don't think it really matters, but you know, if they have the numbers on, I may as well put them back in order. It shouldn't hurt anything either way. Um, they obviously sent them for a reason. I don't think everything has the numbers on though. Like I don't, I don't think this one does too actually. See, even that one has a 16 stamped on it. So whether or not it matters, I don't know. I really don't think this would have been hand fit, you know, like a Born Vigo Model A would have been. Um, like I said, all this stuff is stamped. So there's really not, I wouldn't think a whole lot of hand fitting to do. Everything should be pretty much the same when it comes out of the stamper. But anyway, I uh, just wanted to have a little overview of Kind of how all this works. Um, I think this is the first time I actually have completely disassembled the entire carriage. Well, almost the entire carriage, except for these little things here. But um, usually I don't get into it this far. But you know, this time, there's all the dirt in here kind of bothered me, so I decided to continue. Um, so I uh, got a lot of cleaning to do. All these parts have to be cleaned up, oiled up, and then reassembled. And hopefully, it'll all work when it's all back together. All right, so um, you can see I've got this carriage pretty much um, mostly assembled here, except for the digit wheels, which ride on this shaft. So this shaft goes in here, and then digit wheels, um, which you can kind of see hopefully back here, um, will then go on there. So I kind of want to show how this works um, initially. So, as you can see, this shaft here has basically two types of pieces on it. It has these uh, idler gears here, which will take transfer the drive from the pinwheel cylinder into the accumulator digits. And then I have these pieces here, which detent one or two positions. These are the carry trips. So that each digit wheel on one side, you can see it has one finger. So as the wheel rotates um, either from zero to nine or from nine to zero, if you're subtracting, that finger will pop these detents out like that. And then when that happens, there is a carry finger on the pinwheel drum, which we can see if we bring this in here, there will be these guys here. See how they're spring loaded um, and what happens is, you notice on the back of these pieces, there's a little ramp on the top and the bottom. So as that finger comes around on the pinwheel cylinder, it hits that ramp and is pushed over into the mesh with this gear and turns it one position. And that's basically how your carries work. And then, so as you can see, here are the little fingers there that will put, be pushed over by that ramp to mesh with the next column. And then you can see these ramped pieces here will then push the tabs back into their forward position. Um, and as I mentioned before, the detents for these carry chips are actually um, different. I don't think I've ever seen this before. Um, usually, like I mentioned, there's uh, a spring and a ball bearing inside these pieces that then detents around the shaft, but these are stand pieces, not machine pieces like they usually are. So in this one, you can see down inside there, there's that little finger there. You can see that little finger detents on a little hook on the side of this piece to detent it in either position. And uh, like I said before, when I was, before I put this back together, those detents are, you see the little hole, side of the hole there, are spring loaded by a spring underneath them so you can push down they're spring loaded up. And then of course these are the um, digit wheel detents. So the digit wheels go in here and then um, the gear teeth on this side will detent against this little peg. And then I think these are kind of like an interlock thing. So as it rotates back, this comes into the front um, of the tooth and then as it continues to rotate over this detent, then this rocks back out again. I think that's kind of like an uh, overshoot type of protection thing, I believe. Um, so that, you know, you can't just, if the, you crank the uh, pinwheel cylinder too fast and give a lot of momentum to the 
accumulator just doesn't just you know spin away out of control and give you an inaccurate result. I believe that's why they have that. So it always comes into interlock and then back out, just so that if the wheel did want to you know have some momentum, this would kind of slow it down somewhat. Um, you can also see this piece here, and what this does, this releases the spring tension on all of these. See, when I release that, then they spring back forward for clearing. Um, and that is operated by this piece, uh, which is table pinned on, oops, table pinned onto this shaft. Um, you can see the hole there that table pins onto. And so when you operate the clearing, it releases all the detents so that it's a much smoother clearing operation. Because otherwise, you know, if you have this all full of nines or something, when you try to clear it, you'll be trying to push all the digits past their detents nine times, so that would take a lot of force. That's why they release the detents on um, clearing. Uh, so, pretty much about it. It's not like a super complicated mechanism. Um, it's just, it's a lot of parts because, you know, you have the same parts for each position. Um, you know, you've got, what, four parts for each position plus the digit wheel makes five. Um, and then kind of the same thing for the counter as well. If we flip this around, see the counter carry down here. Like I said, this piece has a little spring detent so you can um, pop down, carry detents there. So basically, if I rotate one of these past nine, which is kind of hard to do because it has to work past that detent. So now you can see that, that has popped down. I now have nine, not sure you can see, I now have nine in the position there. So basically this would be like a subtraction. So I think it should rotate this way. Yeah, so now you can see it carried all the way over and now I got nines here. So basically that was kind of like subtracting one from this column. And you can see this is basically the same principle. It has these little spring-loaded tabs here. If I can get my finger in there, whichever you can see that spring-loaded or not, but um, you can see that one. Um, when those pop down, they have the same sort of ramps on either side that will push these tabs over to mesh within the next column. And this is kind of similar to the Monroe, um, where you can see this piece here has a double helix. You can see there's a pin there and a pin there and then how they spread out. So kind of like a, a helical spread there. But from this point over, each of these drums only has one pin. And it works kind of like the Monroe where these are, you can see how this is not directly attached to these, but it is kind of, it has a range of motion there. So you can see whichever way I turn this, it drags these in such a way that it always makes the rest of the helix. If I turn it that way, then these all fall in line to form the rest of that helix. If I turn it this way, then they all fall in line to form the rest of the bottom helix. Um, this sort of an efficiency there. And Monroe had that same principle in the models, um, at least models D through, I think it had in the K as well, um, except those were you know, much larger than this. Um, and of course, they were nice enough to make these out of brass instead of pot metal like Marchant did, so this is still working perfectly fine. Um, and I think I've been calling some of these parts brass. I'm not sure that they actually are. Like this whole block down in here I think I probably called that brass, but I don't really think it actually is. I think it's some other kind of alloy. Um, it looks a little bit too red to me to be actual brass. I'm not sure it comes through on the camera, but this is definitely redder than this drum here. So I think this is a different alloy and same with the uh, carriage frame. Um, I don't know why they used um, this, whatever it is. I'm not exactly sure what kind of alloy it is, but not sure why they use this instead of like cast iron or something because like, I believe the sides here are cast iron. Um, at least they are in the Brunsviga and the base is definitely cast iron so not quite sure. And this is not actually what rides on the base either. That's this piece. This plate goes on the bottom of the carriage and this is what actually rides and this is steel or cast iron or something. You see it's kind of got a little bit of surface rust in places. Um, so. As far as the the carriage wheel go, you've got you know steel cast iron riding on a cast iron. So exactly what the point of making this out of a different alloy was, I don't really know. It doesn't really matter. It's just kind of interesting. Um, 
So anyway, um, as you can see, this cooling works perfectly. So of course, this uh, handle is attached to a shaft that is attached to that geared segment down there, and then this is spring loaded um, to an interlock with this. And then of course, so when you pull the handle here, sure you can see, but right there. Um, there's a kind of like a ratchet on the end of that gear that locks into a, a corresponding piece on this drum, rotates the whole shaft, and then when you get to the end, this pops back in, and then you can see how that when I go backwards, it kind of moves that up the ramp so it ratchets back and then locks in ready for the next time. So as far as clearing, um, you can see this is pretty much the same idea. This is for the accumulator. The central shaft has these pins on it. And then inside each of the digit wheels, uh, sure I'll be able to see it or not. If I can see it myself. There it is. So right there on the inside, right there is a little pin. Um, so what happens is when you want to clear, this shaft moves over so that these pins are in line with the pins on the inside of the digit wheels. And then when it rotates, it pushes them all back to zero. And of course, when they all get back to zero, then that's when this is back in its home position. So it re-engages, it slides back over to be out of line with those pins again so that they can rotate freely as you do your calculations. So if I enter some random stuff in here and then pull the handle you'll watch there's also like a little ramp here so you can see it goes up the ramp to pull this out now it's in line now those pins on the inside are in line with the pins on the inside of the digit wheels which is the pins on the shaft now are in line with the pins on the inside of the digit wheels so when you rotate this pushes them all back to zero and then as soon as they get to zero this is back in line with its uh, resting place again so it pops back in and then disengages and then you're ready to spin them for your calculations again so um, pretty simple really um, it's just you know because there's you know a certain number of parts for, for each digit wheel you've got 16 digits it just amounts to you know a lot of parts uh, when you take everything all apart um, but as far as principle it's a pretty simple mechanism uh, and of course the accumulator section works basically the same um, these detents are a little bit different for the accumulator versus the counter, uh, of course, because the accumulator, uh, the other reason why is because the accumulator, you know, you're generally moving that more positions than the counter. The, each counter wheel will only move, you know, one position, maximum one position for each crank. You know, even if you carry over, the next one's only going to move one and so forth. But here, you know, you can have up to, how many inputs does it have? nine inputs moving nine positions, so quite a bit more movement going on in the accumulator register. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to kind of describe how some of the stuff works. Uh, I do still have to clean up this shaft, but um, finish cleaning up those digit wheels, and I've cleaned up the inside of these, and of course I've applied a light, coil, a light coating of oil to everything. But I haven't finished cleaning up the outside. You can see there's still some dirt on these zeros here. And the reason for that is because, you know, working around with this, sometimes you have to, you know, pick it up and move it different directions and hold it a funny way to get everything lined up uh, when you're putting it back together. So more than likely, I'm going to, at some point working on this, getting the accumulator back in, I'm probably going to get oil on these again too, just because, you know, when you're working with something, it kind of just happens. Um, so I'll, I'll do a final cleaning once I have everything all reassembled, just, you know, surface cleaning on the outside of the digit wheels there. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, coming back together, I still have to put this plate, I guess, goes on back there. Um, kind of like a little cover for when this is extended beyond the main, um, you know, it's all the way over and that piece is extended out the side, just a little bit of a dust cover. Um, so it starts to go back on and probably clean it up a little bit, has some dust on it. Yeah, uh, coming back together pretty nicely so far. All right, so um, carriage rebuild is done. I'm just going to add a little bit of grease on some of these points, like this spring here, that spring there, and the little ramps on either end. Um, but you can see if we, oops, we pop some numbers in here. Let's 
scratch myself on that detent. Oh, I need to get that one. I must have missed that spot. Double check that, but put some random numbers in here and pull the handle. Everything clears right out and it springs back just fine. Same thing with the accumulator, which I think I already demonstrated, but. Is out just fine. Um, everything is nice and smooth. Of course, all the detents work. Tested that. Um, so yeah, um, just then I'm just gonna put a little bit of grease on some of these spring points here. Cause this, like I said, you know, when you clear it, so the shaft spring is over, or not springs over, but moves over on this ramp, and this is just a spring to return it. So I'm gonna put a lot of grease there and there, and of course on the little ramps, cause those are you know um, spring tension on there all the time. So I just wanna. Put some grease on there. There was oil on it already, but I was gonna add some grease because that's a higher uh, tension area. But anyway, I'm pretty satisfied with how that came out. Um, to clean up the digit wheels, I just use a little, little bit of lacquer thinner and go really quickly and carefully um, because if you scrub these too hard with the lacquer thinner, I think it will take the digits off. So just have to be uh, careful with that. But um, yeah, pretty satisfied with how that came out. So I'll put the grease on there and then you can put the uh, cover back on and as you can see I have it misaligned now as you can see um, look much nicer um, when we first took, took a look at this machine you could barely even see the zeros in there everything was so dirty so um, it's a lot nicer now uh, unfortunately it points out how bad the cover is but I don't know what I can do about that um, if I wanted to repaint this, you'd lose all the numbers, which I really don't want to do. And of course, this uh, Japanese writing on the front here. So I just have to live with the cover as is. But at least you'll be able to see the digits now. So I'm pretty satisfied with that. Um, so next thing is the rest of the machine is apart. You can see this is the side that goes here. This is the side that goes here. And then there's all these little supports that kind of go in the middle there or somewhere. Um, reason for that is the more oil I ran, not really ran through, but the more oil I applied and then worked on the cutting wheel cylinder, the more dirt seemed to come out. So um, I decided it would be best to just see if I could take it apart. And it's apart. Um, didn't come apart very easily and we'll have to um, a solution to some things. So uh, first thing, the way that this shaft is constructed, this is the cutting wheel cylinder shaft and this is the input drive gear here. And then of course all of these pieces you know, slide on this shaft. So they're slide on the other way because this is keyed. So my thumb is bleeding, that's inconvenient. Slide on something like that and then there's a keyway there um, and these are like kind of a press fit on here you can really get it to go past that point um, and some of these like this end piece here it doesn't even want to go past that point so um, it's pretty difficult to take this apart um, and I kind of have a feeling you're not really supposed to take it apart um, because it turns out you can see these holes here actually take springs and then those springs push on, you can see there's a corresponding hole, maybe in there. The, core, the springs push on those and then those ride up and down. And these little slots here, like that. And those are the detents. Um, you can see, the cutout there, that, that uh, pointy end goes in these cutouts here and is the detent for the pinwheel cylinder. Um, so unfortunately what happened was because these were press fit on there, I ended up kind of tapping this shaft out and yeah, I kind of mushroomed the end a little bit. So I'll have to fix that, but that's not a big deal. That should be fine. Just file that round again. That should be fine. Um, so anyway, like I said, I ended up having to tap this out because everything was so tight on there, nothing would come off. 
not realizing that there were springs in here and of course ended up just basically crunching all the springs over as it slid off the shaft. So we'll have to replace those springs. Um, I don't think there's really any damage or anything. You can see there's a little bit of uh, scratching on the shaft there, but that should, that should be fine because you know, like everything is keyed to the shaft. Nothing, you know, rotates on that. Um, so we're not worried about that at all. Um, so I think the way that they put this together is they'd, you know, press one on and then assemble its spring and detent and um, setting disc, or I guess what you'd call these things uh, with the little tabs on them. Um, all assemble that on the shaft and then slide the next one on. Um, but because taking it apart, everything was press fit on, um, there really wasn't a good way that I could see to kind of pull each piece off individually. I don't have like a pull or anything to go on here. Um, so anyway, that's what we ended up with. Like I said, I think nothing is damaged. It should go back together just fine. Just have to replace all the springs, which is not a huge deal. Unfortunate, but not a huge deal. Um, and of course, once all those go on, uh, and then you get this piece, which goes on here, and then there's a, should go on anyway. There it goes on like that, and there's a, whoops, wasn't even showing it. This goes on like that, and then there's a pin, table pin that goes through there, which luckily came out without a fight. And then that, of course, is the riding surface for the uh, Carry, uh, counter direction shifter gear, that's this. And then after that, this piece screws on. So again, I'm not showing. And this is the, um, the you know, directional, anti-directional thing. So like when you start rotating it in one direction, you can't go backwards, it's a kind of a ratchet like that. Um, that screws on and then holds everything in place. Uh, and then there's another pin that goes through that. That one didn't come off so easy. You can kind of see I messed up the bottom of the hole there. Um, so, and that hole's a little bit messed up. There's actually another tiny hole here actually and they drilled it incorrectly. But um, because the pin that goes through this doesn't actually affix it, you know, position-wise on the shaft, it just prevents it from rotating. Um, I think if we clean up this hole and put a new pin in there, we should be just fine. Um, because again, the only force on that pin is to keep it from rotating, so that's not a, a huge amount of force, I would say. So I think we'll come out of this fine, as long as we can find replacement springs. Um, like I said, not the correct way to disassemble it, but you know, when you make a mistake, the important thing is how you recover from it. And I think we're going to recover from this just fine and end up with a totally functional machine. So um, as far as that goes, I'm not really concerned about it. And just have to know for next time, if you take one of these apart, um, be more careful about the springs in there and um, of course drilling out the pin correctly. But anyway, uh, like I said, I think we'll be just fine. And now you can see just how dirty this stuff is. And really, you know, you can see that's supposed to be copper and just how, or you could see if it would focus how black everything is. So yeah, uh, I don't think any amount of flushing oil through would have really ever gotten that truly clean. So I'm uh, definitely glad I took it apart. Um, it's an opportunity to clean it up. It's just really dirty. Uh, and this is the, one of the dirtiest uh, pinwheel machines I've ever worked on actually. Of course, because usually the pinwheel machines have a cover over them. Um, of course, this one did not. I think these hybrid machines originally came with like a little suitcase to put them in. Um, but, you know, who knows how long this one has gone with its suitcase missing. So, all that dirt got in there and stuff to clean it up. So, um, I guess I'm come out of this just fine. So, I'll get to work on cleaning this up and then we can um, locate some springs and hopefully reassemble this. Uh, this, of course, is the uh, locking piece so this goes in kind of like that and then that's what that little finger pushes on when you release the handle to unlock the um, lever so you can set a number and then when you pull the handle again it swings back over to lock it and that just goes through the center of these detents here so you can see when it's like this the detent can you know detent when it's like this then it locks it so you can't adjust the uh, 
love it. So anyway, I uh, got some cleaning to do there. Uh, I'm going to do some more disassembly on this. This is the back view. Um, take that away for now. Uh, like this should come off of here so this can get uh, soaked and cleaned. Um, this is the counter carry drive, which is pretty smooth, but the gear itself is pretty nasty. So get that cleaned up. Um, see if we can take some more stuff off of here. It looks like this whole frame assembly should come off. Take these two screws out and get some more of this stuff off here. Clean that up. Of course, it has to be cleaned up too because I drilled out the pin in here. So now there's metal filings over the place. That all has to be cleaned up. Um, yeah, so with this off of here, pretty much the only thing left is the bell clapper, which I may or may not take that all off and clean it up as well. And this piece, which doesn't seem to want to come out, they must have, you know, pressed this together inside the frame there, so I just have to clean it up. That's the uh, only piece left in here. So, like, these are seem to be pressed in, as far as I can tell. These little levers here won't come out, so you can't slide it out this way. And of course, this is bent up on the front with this piece installed, so you can't you know, slide it out that way. So I don't know if that screws out or if it was pressed in, but anyway, um, yeah, lots of cleaning to do. And kind of interesting, you can see, if you look inside the bell, almost like that was full of water at some point, but the rest of the machine doesn't really show any signs of that ever happening. So. I really don't know what that's about. It's very strange. Um, but you think that you know, there'd be copious amounts of rust on everything if it was you know, out in the rain or something, but I don't know. I don't have anything to worry about. Uh, I don't think the belt is going anywhere, but um, it's kind of interesting. So, yeah, uh, of course, these are the uh, drive gears for the input visible register. So these go basically, if I pick up the pinwheel discs here. This would be your pinwheel disc. This meshes in like this. So as you ro rotate your lever, it kind of rotates this. And then this drives the gears in this register here for the visible input. So that's Basically, how that works, pretty simple. Um, so I guess that's about all I had to say for now. Um, like I said, pretty satisfied with the couch, so hopefully we can do just a good job with the rest of this. You can see these cleaned up uh, pretty well. Um, I already started uh, reassembling a little bit there. Um, so I'll go over um, you know, how all these pieces fit together, probably when I get closer to the end. Um, but you can see these are pretty Pretty nice pieces here. Um, all the machining they had to do this. You know, they had to cut all these grooves in here and then I guess they probably cut these in first and then face this down because um, you need this uh, ring in the middle here for these to ride on. And of course they cut out this for the detent. Um, my little raised area on the back too. And you can see they actually cast in so got a little piece of a uh, Shoe in there. Got to from the cleaning process here. I can get that out. No. Um, you can see that these were cast in the uh, these little spring-loaded uh, tabs here for the carries. Um, so yeah, pretty happy with how those came out. Like I said, I did start reassembling a little bit. Um, the springs that I'm using are not exactly the right springs for this, so they do require a little bit of adjusting, um, which is kind of an annoying process. So I uh, kind of just want to get through all of this, and then when I get to the last one, um, then I'll probably show the reassembly of that step, just so you can see how all the pieces fit together and how everything works here. Um, yeah, you can see that at one time, these were... Uh, either chrome or nickel plated. You can see a little bit of the plating left on there. Not a whole lot. Um, and of course, these are numbered. You can see the number three there. Um, yeah, overall, like I said, these clean up pretty well. Um, 
is the uh, back side. So that's where the detent rides in, the little tabs there for the detent. And then this trough here is where the pinwheel pins ride in. Um, that raises or lowers them depending on whether the trough is, or the upper trough or the lower trough is over the pin. Um, like I said, I'll show all that once I get down to the last step. I'll kind of just want to get through fitting all these, fitting all the springs in. Um, and then we'll show that. So, um, so I was pretty confident that this was going to come together just fine, the pinwheel cylinder. As you can see, I've only got uh, two more um, setting levers to install with their appropriate um, pin sets. Um, so, so I was pretty confident this is going to come together and be just fine. Uh, I decided to turn my attention to the last contentious issue, which was the broken pin. And as you can see, I did was able to get this out. Uh, of course, I put the crank handle back on because... Um, you can see the pin is out of there. Um, I was fitting a new pin. So normally when I make these videos, I just try and like, you know, hack it together with whatever I have. But um, in this case, I actually decided to get the proper tool. And as you can see, I've got these uh, taper pin removers. Um, I got the full set. Uh, I know I only need the small ones, but um, there didn't seem to be any sets that were just the small ones. It was either sets of, you know, just the big ones or sets of the whole thing. So uh, I got this, um, just the cheapest one I could find. Um, kind of funny in my opinion, you know, these are basically just, you know, special sticks of metal. Um, and this set actually cost more than the entire calculator cost, um, which is kind of funny to think about, you know, there's a hell of a lot more machining work that went into these pieces um, a lot more manual effort too. You know, I'm sure these are all made, you know, computer controlled, probably no human involvement, but just the, thought that was kind of funny that these cost, I think almost these cost like twice as much as the calculator cost. But anyway, people actually need these, so they can charge whatever they want. Um, made in India, which I'm seeing a lot more of that. So this is actually a global video here. We've got the calculator made in Japan. We've got dulled drill bits, probably from China. Who are dull trying to draw that pin out? We've got uh, failed punches made in USA. The punch failed before the writing even wore off it. And uh, table pins from India. So, anyway, um, I got these number three zero uh, by one inch table pins. Um, Got 50 of them, so given the weight that I've been using these, that should last me the rest of my life. Um, and got the number 30 taper pin, just put in the uh, vice grips and just you know manually went through. Um, and you can see we've got a nice, uh, nice clean bore there. The, the um, ends here are kind of messed up a little bit. I'll probably file that down. So it didn't gleam quite exactly to the end. There's just a little tiny bit at the end that was messed up so the we didn't get that that part but you know if you look through the hole it's smooth you know 99 percent of the way through so it's going to have a good um area to you know hold the pin there and if we put the pin in it was nice and smooth and even just with that little little push there it stays in so the taper is a a good fit there it's a good grab so um yeah that is definitely makes me feel a lot better about that. Um, I have a nice, nice, good, solid pin in there now instead of that remains of the broken one. Um, the unfortunate part is while trying to get that out, um, I did crack this casting here. So I'll probably see if I can. Really, that should be brazed, but I'll see if I can just solder it back on. Um, you now that just keeps the shaft aligned, but. So we'll see how that goes. Um, that's unfortunate, but I really can't believe how hard that pin was. Um, what I ended up doing was getting some of the uh, grinder tools on the Dremel. And because, so this side was the side that was broken off. So um, that piece of the pin was already out. So it was just the piece, you know, from the end of this shaft over to the end of the crank that was left. So I started by grinding in on this side, which is why so a little bit, you can see a little bit of a gap there, kind of messed that up, but that's just at the very end, so it should be fine. Um, that's kind of ground in, and then 
they were kind of hammered on it and ground in some more until finally the pin started moving and I was able to drive it out. Um, so I didn't actually have to grind you know, all the way through. It did eventually start moving at some point. Um, so yeah, pretty glad to get that out of there. Um, like I said, unfortunate about the casting, but it's uh, definitely put up a fight on this one and I think we'll come out okay. Uh, of course the crank is uh, here somewhere that part came off, but that's not lost, it's here. Um, so yeah, I can take this out and then we should be able to take this back off, hopefully. I have to, there we go, there we go. So now it, it would only go in one way, so when we put this back together, you know, it'll, if we put it in, if we put it together and the pin doesn't fit, then we just have to rotate this 180 degrees, put it back together and it should be fine. Um, not exactly in the center, but I think it'll be okay. You know, there's not like a huge amount of stress on this crank. You know, it's not like you're cranking some kind of massive apparatus or anything. You're just rotating the pinwheel cylinder. So, um, not going to be super concerned about it. I think it'll be just fine. Um, definitely better than leaving it like it was with the broken pin in there. So, um, got to clean this up. Um, see about reattaching the broken casting and finish up the pinwheel cylinder and then as you can see I've already started cleaning up the uh, gear train here. This stuff's all clean, ready to go back together. Uh, I still have to clean up the intermediate drives all the way in the back there for um, those that would go in between the pinwheel cylinder and the input visible register. Um, so I still have to clean that stuff up yet but yeah um, I'm hoping that this was the last difficult part of this repair. Um, so we'll probably get back to the premium cylinder next and see where we go from there. All right, let's try this out, see if I can show the last assembly here on camera. Um, so I don't know if I mentioned it before, but the reason why these were so hard to come off was because you can see, it would focus, right next to the keyway there, there's two little stake marks. So it looks like they put them on and then stake them on uh, which of course pushes the metal out against the key and also down against the shaft and that's where it was hard to get off. So what I ended up doing was just taking a file and lightly filing, see right there, on, you can't see because the stupid thing won't focus, on either side of the, seriously? On either side of the keyway there I just filed a little bit, um, not in the keyway itself, just on the bottom so they would slide on the shaft easier, but still be tight on the keyway because you don't want these to, you know, move or be out of alignment or anything. So um, these go on a lot easier now. Um, so that's nice. Um, so I'm not sure if I explained how this works, but you know, probably most people that watch my videos already know how a pinwheel calculator works. But um, it's always nice to see. You know, it's one thing to know how it works, but it's always nice to actually see it work. Um, at least in my opinion, anyway. So anyway, this is the inside of, not the inside, one side of the um, setting lever disc here. You can see the setting lever on top there. Um, and of course, here is the detent side. So that's where really the spring-loaded detent latches into each one of these little peaks there. And then this over here is the lever setting side. So each of the pinwheel pins, you can see in there, has a little uh, knob on it. That little knob rides in this track so that when the, the because this whole thing rotates when you move the setting lever so when the lower track is over the knobs then the pin is inside the drum which this camera would actually be functional uh, and then when you rotate it so that the upper part of the track is over the knob that pushes the pin up to extend out of the drum which you can see here in this reassembled one you can see all the pins are retracted inside the drum. If I move this one step, you can see that that pin extends out of the drum because the higher portion of the track is now over the knob on that pin. If I rotate it backwards, it pops back in because the lower portion of the track moves over the knob and pulls the pin back in. Um, and of course, these are the tracks that the pins ride in. And of course, these are your uh, carry actuators. Um, Basically, the, I think I showed this on the uh, counter carry, but basically how these work is each time a carry uh, trip is set, 
that extends out into right about here, so when the drum rotates around, it pushes the pin over a little bit to be in line with the uh, intermediate gear on the accumulator so that when this passes by the accumulator, it drives that uh, digit one position forward. And then this ramp here pushes the carrier trip back into its uh, untripped state. Uh, so, see if we can apply a bunch of oil here, just to make sure that these pins are going to slide nice and easy. To fill up these, I know I have the pin soaking over, I like to fill up these little troughs with oil anyway. Um, you know, you're not supposed to have too much oil because it attracts dirt, but I plan on keeping this machine covered because you know, even any amount of dirt that gets in here, once it gets inside this cylinder, you have to take the whole thing apart to clean it out, which I really don't want to have to do this again. Um, it would be nice if you keep it clean, you don't have to keep taking it apart. Um, anyway, I plan to keep this machine covered is what I'm saying, so that dirt should hopefully not really be an issue going forwards. So I'm just going to put each of these pins in with the knob facing facing with the knob closer to the center. Um, that's how they go in. Actually what I should have done is put this on first. This is the detent here so this just drops down on the shaft and then I have to compress this spring. I've already got the spring installed off camera because it's kind of an annoying job to do. So that's in there. So now this is loaded. So let's keep going around putting these in each, each position has nine pins so now is the time when we find it if we lost one uh, we shouldn't have because I've been keeping track of them at every stage every operation like when I clean them and then oil them and everything, I count them each time to make sure that none got lost in any stage. Um, because it's bad when you get to the end, if you don't do that and you get to the end and you find one missing, well then you have no idea at which point you lost it, so you don't know where to look. So, count them after every step, and you find one missing after the cleaning step, well you know to look every place you have them during cleaning. And I have lost, doing cleaning stuff, I have lost a few, so I had to go back and find them again. Yeah, it looks like all of them are present. These are precision machines, so they only just fit right in. It's a slip fit, I guess. Apply some oil all the way around here. Make sure that there's oil in the carry chip grooves here, so that these are going to have some oil to ride in. So now what I do is I move all of these out to their extended position. Move them out too far because then they'll fall out. Reason being, once I put the disc on, the only way you can grab these pins is by what's sticking out of the drum. So, just apply some oil to the tracks here on the disc. Let the detent set something to ride in, and then apply some oil to this track here. That's all oiled up. Be fine. So now I will take this and make sure. So you can see here where the upper portion is. It's right here because you can see through the teeth and see where the track is. So what I'm going to do is align this so that the upper portion is on, on top of all the knobs. And then I have to move it over this way to catch the detent and then pull it back on. And now. I've gone too far. This actually needs to be that position. I believe. 
make sure I don't have the detent caught. I'm going way off here. That's, this needs to be here. So you can see when all the pins line up and this one has decided to escape. Oh, there goes another one. Let's try this again. Get all these lined up again. See if I can pay attention this time. And there goes another one. I have to pay attention this time and get the groove lined up properly. So we want the camera's kind of in the way. We want this lined up like this so that the groove, the upper portion of the groove is over top of all of the pins. Now I should be able to catch the detent like that. So now this side should be flat down. That's just not quite, so I didn't quite catch it all the way, I guess. Of course the all I have to do is turn the camera on to make it difficult. All the other ones went in fairly smoothly. Once you I got, kind of got the hang of how I wanted to do this, and of course because the camera's on this one, it's going to be difficult. So let's try this again. So, need this to be like that. Push this in. Push this one back out because it went in too far, so I can't grab it. There. So now what we want to do is, you can see this is flush here now, so I definitely have caught the detent. So just grab these with the pliers so you feel them latch in. Snapped in right there. Comes in. So over here, work our way around the middle. Comes in. There we go. See now how it dropped down? So all these should be in now. So we're just going to apply, get that cup out of the way, I don't need that anymore. Apply a bit of oil to the top portion here. A bit of oil over here to the detent. Probably should have done that first, but it's fine. And now we'll flip the next drum over, apply some oil to these pivots, or the everything's pivot, and put a little bit of oil, it's a light coating on the drum itself so it slides nice on the disc here. And now just line this up so. See, it's still a kind of a tight fit, but enough that I don't have to, you know, hammer it. This is a little bit tighter than I thought it would be. There. And now, hopefully, this will operate. Reach this way, like that. It's going to be a little bit strong on the detent, but I think it'll be okay. I can move it with my finger. So maybe I'll go back in there and just shorten that spring a little bit. This is a little bit stiffer than I'd like. Actually, that one kind of is too. So I might go back in there and lighten that spring detent a little bit. Um, you can see the difference there. These ones are not too bad. That one, it's a bit stiffer. So, that oh, feels okay. Must have just been the angle I had it at, maybe. That oh, feels just fine, that's weird. Maybe I was putting too much pressure on this. I was kind of squashing it. Now it feels 
this one. Of course, you want to make sure, you know, that when you just give a little push, it firmly latches in because if it kind of just floats in, in the middle like that, then you're going to get inaccurate results because you got a half, a half pin sticking out. So I want to make sure that it always, I wonder if maybe I was pushing on this. That might have been what was making it stiff. Um, it's nice and smooth. It's a bit stiffer, but okay. So maybe not perfect, but definitely it's going to work. Um, of course, it would have been better, you know, if you had the original springs, but I think we'll be okay. Um, it was all slippery now, but... And, of course, all these things have an order that they go in. Um, you'll notice that the starts and ends of the pin sections on each disc is different. So, you know, this one starts all the way back here, but this one doesn't start till here. And I believe the reason for that is so that, um, you know, if you have numbers in every column, you're not adding everything at exactly the same time, um, which kind of reduces the input effort needed. So, you know, like if you have, say, if you put nine in every column and you go to turn the crank, if all these pins were exactly in line, you'd be adding nine in every column at exactly the same time. Um, now, if they stagger them like this, you know, this one starts first, so you get a little bit of drag, and then it's like these two start next to you, then you get some more drag, and then so on, and it kind of like works up to all the numbers working together and then kind of tapers off uh, in the same sort of fashion. Um, I believe that's why they did that anyway. And of course, these have to be staggered in the proper order. So if you mess up the order of one of these disks, then you won't have this nice, you know, helix type uh, shape here, which will mess things up. These have to all happen sequentially. Because, um, you know, if you get a carry in this column, and then that might trigger a carry in the next column. So this carry has to be after that one. And if you mess it up, then you're going to start missing carries in some cases. Uh, so I think that's going to be um, pretty much good for that. Just have to you know, oil up each of these and put them on. Um, a little oil there, there. And of course, oil the pivots on the back. And you should just slide it right on, theoretically. Everything lined up properly. This one is a bit tighter again. There we go. And of course, this is um, cut out, and there's a little bit of it there too. There's a little <laughs> finger that goes in there um, when the machine's in the uh, home position. So we're just about a, just about out of oil here. To refill my little oiler thing, and these are marked. I'm assuming those are numbers in Japanese. Um, you can see it makes that little hole there for a little finger to go in. And this isn't any oil, this is just the end plate and it has a little guide there. So I actually put some oil in that. That's a little guide for the um, end of this shaft here. Make sure that lines up. Yeah. And this will move in and out to lock and unlock each individual cylinder. So the next piece that goes on here is the um, guide for the uh, transmission gear for forward and reverse on the counter. Uh, I still have to clean that up yet, and then that has a pin to properly affix it. So um, with any luck, that'll go on and the pin will line up and everything will be happy. And then we've got that um, piece that screws on the detent um, so you can't go backwards in the middle of a cycle has to go on yet and get a new pin in that but that is satisfactory I think um, definitely glad to and of course I still have to find the little spring that goes in the end there that 
Oh, should not have gotten messed up. I just have to find that it probably sprung out. So hopefully should be able to find that and put that back in, just a little spring to push this over. Um, so yeah, so I hope to find that and clean up the remaining two pieces to put on there. But uh, like I said, I think this will be satisfactory. Um, maybe not, you know, 100% perfect, but um, I'll take it. You know, like I said, this is the first time getting into one of these, so, you know, a lot of times you make some mistakes the first time, but like I said, I think we've uh, recovered just fine. It'll work, so just uh, know for next time how these come apart and that you should take each disc off one at a time, take the springs out instead of trying to take them all off at once. And it's going to kind of be a dangerous operation um, because, like I said, these are all you know staked on, so I really don't want to come off. And brass is a soft metal, so you don't want to pry too hard on the outside here because it might bend it, and then you're really going to be in trouble. But anyway, uh, that's enough talking. We'll go on to the next piece. All right, so as you can see, I've got um, this part reassembled here, all the gear train here. Um, and there's a little explanation of how this actually works. So you can see over there the pinwheel cylinder. <clears throat> and this gear, of course, slides back and forth, which you see before that's controlled by this shift fork here. Um, and that gear engages with either this gear down here or this gear right here. And <clears throat> when you put these together, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see or not, but notice how the teeth here are uh, filed slightly. There we go. Be hard to go. Okay, there we go. So you can see there they're not. If I come back, you can see there they are. So it's important to get those that are filed like that, and you notice that there's the same way on this gear here, um, put back together such that they will line up with or that there'll be times so that um, when the machine is at rest, these are meshing, these file courses are meshing with the sliding gear so that when you crank the machine and you stop at the end of the cycle, um, these line up and you'll be able to slide that gear back and forth easily versus if you stop it, you know, if the machine was at rest when the gear teeth were like this, it, you'd have to be exactly right on in order to get the teeth to line up for that gear to slide back and forth. So um, it's kind of, <clears throat> I don't know why that's like that. Um, and of course they're filed uh, the same way this gear, so when it slides back that way, um, it also works. I'm actually not even sure why they have it filed this way because that gear doesn't slide over far enough to engage with this one. It only engages either with this one or that one. So I'm not sure why they filed that. I don't think there's anything that slides over that far, but. Anyway, um, just something to take note that you want the file portions to line up um, such that they're engaged when the machine's at rest so that you can usually engage that uh, transmission gear there. So, um, how this actually works. So, this is the uh, counter increment finger. So you notice when I turn this, that finger pops out. If I turn it the other way, the bottom finger pops out and comes around like that versus now the top finger comes out and comes around like that. So that's your bidirectional counter. Um, depending on which way you turn the machine, of course, this will turn either direction. And the reason why they have two different fingers that pop out is because of the um, <clears throat> tens carry on the counter. If you just had one finger at a fixed place, um, say the finger was fixed, you know, right here. Say this finger was the fixed finger. If I turn the machine this way, it's going to click over at the very beginning of the stroke. However, if I turn the machine the other way, of course, it retracted back in, but suppose it was still stuck out here, so if we can make it... Oh, it's going to be hard because this is... I'm not going to be able to really do it because this, this plate on the outside is fixed. You'd have to get... Yeah, something to, to get that here. I have to get this piece to advance or so 
or if I just with my finger I'm going to cooperate. I don't know if you can see the finger now, but as this comes back around, so say this was now, I'm turning the crank the other way, this would be at the end of the cycle, as it comes back around, it'll click the counter over like right about there, and now that's the end of the cycle right there. So, the issue with that is, in order for the counter carry to work properly, it has to, it's like ripple carry, right? So, the carry has to propagate from the digit that's being incremented all the way across the the other digits as needed. So like if you had a nine in this column and you have the finger increment, that's gonna carry over to a 10. So you need to increment and then propagate the carry to the next digit. And if you had all nine, you'd have to increment and then propagate, propagate, propagate in sequence all the way along. So in the fixed finger scenario, if you turn the crank in a one way, it's fine. It increments right away and then has time to propagate all the way across. But in the other scenario, if you turn the crank handle the other way, and then that fixed finger wouldn't increment until the very end, now you don't have time to propagate all those carries across, and you won't have your uh, carry propagation in the counter. So that's why they have two different fingers that um, retract or extend based on the direction, so that the finger always increments the counter on the very beginning of the cycle. So if I go this way, it increments right there. I go this way, increments right there, and then it always has the entire rest of the cycle to for this gear to drive the counter carriage on the pocket all the carries across. Um, and how they did that is there's um, these are little fingers here on the are the, in the end of two little rocking plates in there, and there's a cam on this gear. Is if I rotate this gear, it either pushes that finger or it pushes that finger to activate them. And then there's a, of course, the finger can only move so far, and then the gear starts to drive the entire drum. Um, and, and they make sure that the finger actuates first because this little piece here, you can see, has a little divot, a little divot in the drum there. So that keeps the drum, provides some friction on the drum so that the finger actuates first, and then when that stops, then it has to overcome that friction and drive the drum. Um, kind of a cool little mechanism there. Um, yeah, so then this, the main power input comes, of course, from the crank handle and through here to this gear. And then this gear drives the gear on the left side. You can just barely see it over there of the pinwheel drum. And then, of course, the whole drum rotates, which drives the sliding gear on the right side. And then that sliding gear drives either this gear or this gear. Um, and of course, if it's driving this gear, this gear drives this gear, which drives this drum gear. And then there's a little gear attached to the end of the drum, which drives underneath of this gear to drive the counter uh, increment. Um, and then this piece just here just has this little spring. You can see it right there to uh, hold it down in that little divot there. Um, this is the detent for the shift fork, which I have not installed yet because it has to go in after the uh, Pinwheel drum goes in. This, of course, is the counter or the input clearing rather that'll get hooked up later. Um, this is kind of an interesting mechanism. So this has cams like this. So right up in here is where you can see the little fork here. And focus, that's exploded. Um, right up in here is where the um, what is this camera doing? Seriously. Thank you. Um, anyway, right up in here, right, right there is where this will go on the shaft for the input uh, register. And so when this rotates, you can see a little divot there, this will push this out. And what this does is, if I bring this over here, this will push on here, and there's another one that pushes on the other side over here. I think if I can, there we go, actuate it. And that will release the detents on the um, input slider so that when you clear the input register, um, you're not pushing past all the detents on all those little setting levers. Um, it releases those so everything uh, smoothly goes back to the home position or the zero position rather um, when you pull this handle. So that's just a release on that end. 
Like I said, there's one here and then there's another one you can see right here, here's part of it um, on the other side. So they both pull in and release uh, both sides. Uh, so that was kind of cool as well. This thing here, this is that little plunger I was talking about that goes in this hole here on the film wheel drum. And that is some kind of carriage lock thing that interacts with this piece. Um, this little finger here, a little pin on here, I'm not exactly sure what that's for, but I believe this goes in like this. And then, um, so when the drum rotates and it pushes this out, it rocks this forward. You can just not really see. This will push out because as the drum rotates, it pushes this out of its hole. And then that will rock this piece forward. And that I believe will lock the uh, carriage so you can't slide the carriage when the machine is not at the end of a cycle. Uh, so, I think what we are going to do now is let the camera roll and see how far we can get before either I mess something up or realize I forgot to clean something. So let's uh, so move my chair into everything. You can see um, I've got this plate basically stripped down. That's as stripped down as it goes. Try to autofocus again, see if it's going to behave itself. So I don't want to keep poking the camera the entire time. Anyway, so like I said, this is a shirt that I was going to get. Um, there's only two pieces left on here, which is the bell, which the bell actually looks like it's brass. So I don't know why there's a giant rust puddle in the middle of it. But anyway, we've got the bell and we've got this uh, spring mechanism on the bottom, which is the spring for this. This sticks through, I guess this hole here, and this will be over like that. And that kind of springs this up. Um, so no need to take those off. Um, of course, this one is loose because I had to move it out of the way to get one of the screws out. There's a whole bunch of screws in there to hold the, there's uh, three pedestals. You can see here. There's the pedestal that holds this finger and is also a support for the, for this shaft, which is the, what that peg on the crank handle pushes on to release the, you can see it operates this. Um, there's this, which is a pedestal to hold the end of the shaft for the big drum gear. And then there's this pedestal, which supports the shaft here, which holds um, a couple of interlocks, this interlock, this interlock, is the stop for the counter clear, and is also what holds the intermediate gears that transfer the rotation to the uh, input register. Anyway, like I said, this is all shipped down. Um, this is where all those pedestals go. You see the pins there. Uh, two pins either side for the side plates. And you have to assemble this outside because of all these pins. You can't, you know, put one side on and then slide the other side in. It won't work that way because of the pins here. Um, anyway, so let's get started. So, first thing that can go on is the bell clapper. That goes somewhere like this, I believe. It has this little screw, holds it in place. And you'll notice that I have applied some oil to um, different positions on the base plate here because these pieces slide directly on the base plate. I'm trying not to get too much in the way of the camera here. And when I took the sides off, there was oil under the sides, so I just put some on there just in case. Um, I'm not really sure if it's necessary or not, but this also has a little uh, spring that goes on it too, which I believe is this. The machine has the most interesting uh, spring hooks. See that looks now? I've ever seen. Let me. Like, you know, most machines, focus, most machines, they just, um, you know, bend a little piece of wire or um, have a stamped hook, but this one looks, it looks like, you know, it's a, a fat pin and then it, it tapers down and they're all like that. So I don't know, you know, whether they, you know, um, stretched out a piece of metal till it like, 
thought Flynn broke off and the Ben would have made the hook or how they made those, but something I haven't seen before. Um, so it was interesting. So then we have this piece, which goes on right here and will interact with this. It also has a screw that holds it in place. And of course, if I've applied a coating of oil to everything here, just as a, some rust prevention. And of course, because these pieces needs to get components lost there. If I use the wrong screw here. I must have stopped these. That will not go in there. Let's see if this one will. That one will. So this one must go in here actually. The assembly is not as exciting as you might think it is. Also, it's kind of slow because I'm looking at arm's length, not getting away with the camera. It goes like that, and then this will go. I don't think this is supposed to go all the way over like that. I think it's just supposed to it lightly. See, when it trips over like that, then it doesn't let it come back. So I think it's just supposed to trip lightly like that. Let's see how it looks when it's all back together. Um, there should be a spring somewhere here. It might be this one. Goes from here. to here. So if you find this one, you can just skip this part. Rings the bell. Uh, then we have this piece. And this is a little peg you can see that goes in this hole. And it's got this really long screw that goes through here. And then there is a lock washer, a nut that goes on the bottom. So if you find this one, you can just skip this part or fast forward or whatever. See, like I said, when it trips over, it doesn't want to come back. So I'm not really sure. I'll have to see how far it pushes it, but if it just hits it lightly. Then it's fine. So I'll have to see how hard it's going to hit it when the carriage is back on. Um, there's not enough. Of you. Yeah. Anyway, like I said, I'll have to see how it's going to look when the carriage is back on. But hopefully, it's just a little light hit like that. Otherwise, we'll have to find out what is up with this not working. Because everything is free here, it's just. Anyway, uh, so. The next thing, probably what we can do is make sure that these are all lined up in the correct position. So uh, this oil hole here um, is always up towards the top. Um, hopefully everything is timed correctly. It seems like it should be. And we should be able to, hopefully, 
install this. So you want to install this. Um, you start putting a new pin in there. Um, the hole wasn't that bad, so I just kind of left it as is. Like I said, this is not to affix it laterally. It's just to prevent it from rotating, and it is pretty tight anyway. So there really shouldn't be much, if any, stress on that pin at all. So I'm not going to worry too much about it. Um, anyway, you want to install this with this pointing straight up. So, so we can... This piece always likes to be a problem. This needs to go the other way. Let's see if I'll go in like this. Nope, because this is in the way. Let's go out of the way. There we go. And hopefully they should mesh right in like that. Okay, and then we get this side to go in, hopefully. Should line up right there. There it goes. So with any luck, this will be over far enough that we can just pick this right up and set it right on. And see how close we are. So I had to tilt it to get that little finger to go down in the hole there. Um, then it's not. There we go. So this is pretty close. Something's lumpy here. This. All right, so that sand in the middle did not belong where it belongs at all. So let's see. That didn't work. Flip this around and have a better look here. So, how close are we? So, this side looks like it fell in. This side is not going to fall in because these are not in the right position. Actually, none of these are in the right position. Uh, close. Try to look underneath and see how far off we are. I don't think we're that far off, really. Quite sure. I don't need one to go in. Uh, I might end up doing is taking this shaft out if it's going to be. Actually, this is not even in the right position either. All right. Yeah, I think what I'm going to end up doing is taking this shaft out here, which is not that big of a deal. It's a little set screw in it. It'd be easier to kind of hold things together like that, but because nothing is wanting to line up, it's just going to make things much more annoying. So let's see if we can. We should be able to slide this out one way or the other. Maybe. Maybe not. I guess I need to grab onto that because of course everything is oily and slippery now. Anyway, this is pretty free, so I'm not quite sure what is. Well, it must be this place, which is this line anyway. Oh, 
this might be really powers the camera because this is not at all cooperating for some reason. This particular piece is being incredibly difficult. I really do not know exactly why. But this piece here somehow decided to walk up on that shaft. Okay. back out, take this side back off, we will unhook the spring before I stretch it out, and set that off to the side since it's being uncooperative, and proceed without it. Get this line back up here, so it's still timed properly. Back in, so now let's try again. Should we line that up with the little hole there? Of course, everything is all messed up now. So this needs to go over so that this one like that, ideally. I'm trying to show a shot here. And like there. So now that one fell on. This one didn't, of course. Show sure what it's hitting against, but it's not going to do anything. This does not want to. There, now it's on. All right, so now this is down, this is down. Now we're good, and now that will in there. So that's on, that's on, this should. Yep, so you can see when I pulled the handle, see how this springs out? So that's working as expected. All right, so that's good. We'll have to uh, put that other piece in later. That should be fine actually to do that. See so if we can get a couple of screws in here before everything falls apart. So I'll just lift up the back here and put in the two sides get these big screws, uh, one in each corner. If I can get one of these started here. So I'll just put one in each side for now. I'm not going to tighten them too much. Let's see about putting one in the front here. And focus is just what the hell. So now the size should be um, not going to flop off. Now we can put in screw here. Maybe. Maybe not because it's not all the way down yet. I'll see if we can put one in this piece. That one's going to go in. Let me find my screwdriver. Usually these don't, um, you know, fall exactly down, depends there's going to be some kind of friction there, so we'll start a couple of screws in here and see if we can pull it down somewhat. Let's do a screwdriver, it's one of these screw off ends that always keeps on screwing itself. Uh, that hole there, I think, can take one too. We'll see if we can. There we go. So this should be able to be tightened down now. Let's see if we can get another. Put it at the top of my screwdriver. We can get a screw in this piece as well. 
didn't want to cooperate initially. There we go. Now we got one in. So I should be tightening this up just a little bit, not all the way tight, but it should pull it down on the pins and hopefully get it aligned with the other ones here. Move that back out of the way. Yep, now we're good. Like a, I did a dry run on this one. I think this is just figuring out as we go along. Usually I do this off camera, but I figured I'll show it this time if anybody's interested in how I actually figure out how these things go back together. Uh, remember, so much family how it can fun, so much just figuring out as you go along. So all those are there. So then this is that spring. We can. So that will do that. Actually, it looks like that spring spring loaded out of there. Oh, so I was wrong about that. It must be when you move the carriage, it will lock that plate and then push it back in. And of course, it can only go in when it's in the home position. Um, so I was wrong about it being spring loaded in there all the time. It must only go in there every time you move the carriage. But we'll see how that goes when we put it back together, or the rest of it anyway. So now. We should be able to put this back around and see what happens if we give it a crank. That's not good. So we are, oh, it's probably this piece, yep. This piece again, yeah. All right, so the issue is this piece is because it's free floating, it's getting in the way of everything. So really it should sit right there, just like this piece. And then, like I said, when you, um, well, this would be held in like that. And then when you um, do the input clearing, see if I can do this with both of them. These will both pull back like that, theoretically. I right, over far enough, but something like that. Um, and of course this you know, springs back over. This will be held in all the way. I have to see how that's gonna work, but there we go. So we'll see anyway. Um it's kinda hard to do it, but you just doing it by hand, but that should go like all the way over like that. And then this should pull. And then this should be, there's a little bit of a detent there. And it seems to go back even further. Well, we'll see anyway. We'll see how it goes when everything's all, you know, properly tightened down. Um, there's not this spring. This is the spring which we took off of the difficult piece. I have to put that in yet. Uh, but there's another spring that will spring load this back, um, which we can't put in right now. I don't think that this will, there's another piece that has to go in there to, this from locking because if we turn the handle this will spring all the way back and then uh, block it like we saw um, so. anyway um, I think the next thing we can do is move on to this which was being difficult so this piece this is the pedestal so we should be able to we flip this back around here um, to 
be able to slide this in like this. And making sure that this little knob here goes in the groove here. Almost. And In. I just had to push this over a little bit to get that to line up. Now it's in, and now I should be able to install some screws into that. If we can lift this up again here, and there's four screws that go out on this pedestal here. I'll point out that I was wrong about the material of the sides and the pedestal. I thought it was cast iron because I believe. In the Buns Vigo machines, it is, um, but in this one, it's not. It's that uh, same, not quite brass, but uh, alloy that they used in the uh, carriage. And I seem to have lost some screws, so I have to hunt those down. But now I'm feeling confident enough to put the other uh, two screws in the sides here. Get those in. I have to hunt down the two screws. Seem to have dropped out. Um, that pedestal should be held in place fairly well enough with just the two screws that it currently has. Get it nice and flat so everything should line up hopefully. Which is screws are on here somewhere. They went too far. I'll have a look for those then. Anyway, so now hopefully they should be positively affixed to the base. And with this pushed over, that is good. This one's a bit stiff because my spring was a bit stiff, so probably could have gone with a lighter spring tension on that one, but I don't know for next time. So do all work. There's some of them are a little a little bit stiffer than I probably would have liked, but so pay more attention to the spring tension next time. That's not going to be in the way. That seems to be just fine. And if we turn the handle again, get stuck on. It goes that way. Or it's this piece again, right? Yep. And that's in like that and it hits there, so this needs to come back out. So I think so far so good. Um, let's try playing around with this difficult piece now. Do not want to. So what happened was I couldn't get it out because this piece got stuck on it for some reason. I'm suspecting it got stuck right there, which is where the set screw Focus. Right there is where the set screw pinches on the shaft, and of course it messed up the middle a little bit, and that's must be where it got stuck. So let's try um, putting this thing in. So sliding in from this side, make sure I'm still clean. This has to come up, so I'll go through that. I'll go through the um, the post there, and then the first piece that goes on is this piece. Which actually should have gone on first because it has to slot in down there. Okay, I'll have to hook up the spring back onto that. Uh, 
for sure the one for you, yeah, maybe. I'll have to check that out. Um, anyway. So I see it was already pushed in, that's why I was already pushed in all the way and then got stuck there because of the pressure on this, that's fine. Uh, then this. Go on. That goes on in between. I have to look into where that goes because it's not going to fit there, I don't think. Maybe to put it in the right way, maybe it would. Put it in, trying to put it upside down, I wonder it wouldn't fit. Um, Okay, I think I see also what that does. So if we look here, this hook piece here slots into this cam. It just has a little um, cut out there. So either this will normally be locked in like that, and then when you rotate it, it will push out, I think. It'll push in. No. Yeah, I have this in wrong too. I'll have to take a look at that. So that might be where we pause the camera because it actually doesn't make a lot of sense. This would have to be spring loaded into here like that. And then pop out. Unless it's just a thing so you can't rotate the drum while you're clearing. I'll have to take a secondary look at that maybe. But for now we'll keep going. I think I have that in a uh, look at the wheel on the piece and see if I. Actually, it must be where it goes because there's a little nub on the back of that. I'm not sure if you can see there's a little nub down there that this will hit into. So that's probably how that goes. If it's wrong, it's not a big deal to take that shaft out and redo it. So we'll keep sliding this in. Uh, this piece here needs to go on. And there actually is one more piece that needs to go on here, which I didn't clean up yet, which is this piece. So this is the, um, what interacts with this piece down here. So it's the other one from the other side. So I actually have to clean it up yet, put that in. Um, but for now, I'll just slide this shaft. So I think I will anyway. Just slide it all the way in to get it. Out of way. Oh, maybe I will anyway. It's getting kind of difficult for some reason. I have to give it a little tap, but for now that's good enough that we'll hold those pieces in place if we need them. Um, see if I can reattach the spring. Just flip this back around again. And then this spring from down here on this hook down here. If you can see that, because I can barely see it. There's pliers here. Let's put this back up here. No. cam pushes this like that, that will activate and push the well, it doesn't really release the details as well as I'd like it to. I should release them more than that. It doesn't seem to make much difference at all. So I have to look into that. That is not not quite the behavior I would like to see there. Still not. Hmm. 
Hmm, interesting. I have to look into that. Of course, this one back, it doesn't make a difference either. So that might be something to look into. Um, I don't think these go any further down, really. There's definitely still detents there. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of difference. So that might be something to look into. Um, I think I should release those better than that. Um, so, what else can we do while we're here? We can flip this up. Oh, I forgot to mention, I was actually able to get this piece out. Um, turns out that these pieces, that when I looked at them from the bottom, to me it looked like they were, you know, staked in, like these ends were flattened over, but actually they're not, they just pull right out. So, they were to pull those both out and then this came out. Uh, we can slide this back in like so, and then these go like this, and I have a spring to put on them, which I seem to have in this place, so I have to track that down. Um, might leave this like this for now because I'm not, I don't remember exactly which order I took it apart with the carriage. Um, but I believe that this piece go on top of here. Like that. And then inside the center here is that peg on the bottom of the carriage that comes through. Um, I don't remember exactly remember the order. And I'm not sure if that's going to stay together anyway. Um, we also had this piece, which went in something like that. Now, on either side, we had these pieces. The supports for that. Okay, so and you should somehow there are uh, dowel pins for these as well. Okay, that one's aligned. And I thought it was aligned. It actually was not. be pretty close to. There we go. That's all I know. So I can pop uh, at least one screw in each of these. Just to kind of even it out since it seems to be uh, pulling down pretty hard on the dowel pins. to see um we're gonna go I'll have to see if I can uh, fit the carriage in with that like that or if that pin is gonna be too long I actually might have to take this back out to put the carriage in so that may have been a mistake but uh, we'll see um so what is next Next actually might be the carriage. If we do that, we can uh, give this a little test, I think. Um, so let me get the carriage. We'll just see if that'll 
uh, slide in nicely here. We're going to have to play with that a little bit. So here comes the carrot. Let me move this over there. So I'm going to slide it in. Let's see. Actually, you know what? For before I do that. Should have put this on because a little bit of oil on the bottom here. Um, the way the screws go into this, they're kind of hard to get the screws in once it's once the carriage is already in. So it's probably a bit of oil to the bottom of that. We can get this to go in here. It doesn't really help. We need these pieces out of the way. Now I can put this in the middle. Let's see if I can find the other screws for this. Hopefully, here. There's one. I'll leave that one off, so I'll probably get that one in with the oh, man, I'll put it in anyway. But um probably could have put this one in with the carriage in because I think I can slide the carriage over far enough to um access this one with the carriage installed, but excuse me, the chrome plating fell off there, but what I can do about that. I mean, I could take it out and get it replayed, but I'm not going to do that. I'm sure there's nothing I'm going to do about that. Okay, so now, the moment of truth, this will just slide in here nicely, or... Hitting on this, I think. It's not hitting on that. Let's see, I don't see it hitting on anything down in there. So it's hitting on. Be hitting on the. Um, I added a bit of weight to it. And uh, we all know. All right, I'm gonna have to pause the camera now because I need to locate the spring for these pieces because I don't think I can finish installing the carriage without that spring. And I don't have it, see it right in front of my face right now. Not sure whether we are hitting on this or exactly what we're hitting on here. But it's definitely hitting on something. So I'll have to pause the camera there and figure out what exactly it's hitting on and also find the uh, spring for these pieces. Um, I wanted to do this 
too far I could get with one shot, but I think we're just about at the limit now. I don't see that swing here. So I think I'll find that and see where we go from there. All right, so I've got the uh, carriage on. I didn't end up taking these uh, black ice loose again. Not really sure if I had to, um, but it turned out that the issue was there was a peg on the back of the carriage and that little shield on the side here, I'll show that in a minute, was had gotten uh, slightly bent maybe in shipping or over the years or something. And so that pin was hitting on that. So I just bent it out a little bit, stood it in, and it went in just fine. Um, and we didn't notice that when we took it off because I took this off by taking all the screws out of the bottom and lifting the carriage off um, instead of sliding it off. So that's why we didn't notice that before. Uh, I did find the swing here. Um, you notice that this piece doesn't look the best. Uh, I think that's just the plating coming off. I did give it a good cleaning and oiling. So um, I got this swing back on here. These have to, the upper plate sits in between the these two things here. And then it goes on oh, the carriage is difficult again. But. Um, should be able to put this on now. I just need to compress this spring, get it up. Well, that didn't work. All right, now I have to fight with this thing for a little while, I guess. And you get the swing in front of the pin here. I think. Oh, I see. Okay, hold on. You don't want the swing, but you see there's uh, four blocks in the bottom of the carriage there, and those four blocks have to line up with the four blocks on the top of this piece, um, if you can't see now, of course, get this in there. Um, so let's see if I can, it might be easier to get this installed and then try and put this spring. I'm not sure if that would be, actually I can't because this is not over far enough yet. So, so I need to figure out why my carriage is being uncooperative. something else. Alright, so it turns out that I was actually wrong. I took this plate off uh, the bottom of the carriage again because you notice know, right in the middle there, right there is that little peg I was talking about and that will not let you slide the carriage on. And it does have screws, it does come off, but once you've got the carriage on, I don't see any way you can go through the back of the machine, somehow through this gear, and reinstall that. So they must want you, they must have designed this so that you have to take the plate off to remove and reinstall the carriage, which is really inconvenient, and I can't understand like, why they would have chosen that. But That goes on. Um, so I think now I have to put the carriage on because I think if I put this on, I won't be able to have enough uh, movement to install all the screws. So the next thing that has to go on is this. Just make sure I've got, I wanna time uh, this drum something Like that, I think. We'll see. Um, I think I'm going to time it like that so that it's equidistant. Well, we'll see if this works. If not, we'll take it off and retime it. I'm going to time it so that the this pin is sticking straight out, the first one, so that the other one should be exactly 180 from that. And that should give it equidistance to start the carry. So, like, if you turn one direction, it only it's the same distance till the carry starts to propagate. 
as if you turn it the other direction. Hopefully that's right. We'll see if it works. If it doesn't work. And we'll see if we can install this or not. Turn this over a little bit. Just not getting. Yeah, this is not going to be easy. Looks like that already moved itself. Yes. I think I'm out of there. So it has to go back in. That's installed now. So ideally this should should move. It does not because this is not meshing there. So the issue was that our gear, the drum gear was not meshing with the carry drum. Uh, that's why it was not wanting to slide. So theoretically, if I align this right, which I think is right about there. Uh, actually, let me do this right here. Mm. Yeah, I think it should be right about there. That should be in the first position. So, we'll see if our tone handle locks up because Well, not so good so far. I don't know if it's because this is not all the way down or you know, I just wants to push the carriage off. All right, so it goes one. I'll go back to zero. Not really. Is that because of this thing? Yeah, I think it's because this is that was it. This is not going to be easy to test like this. Um, so I think the timing is off because if I try to go, so if I go to one, it's fine. If I try to go backwards to nine, what? Yeah, so you just can't really see with the carry pins, but what must be happening is it's trying to push the carry trip down at the same time the pin is under that, so that is must be incorrectly timed. So what we need to do is move it, um, rotate it, delay it a little bit so that it has time to increment the, I can get this out of here. Delay this, yeah, that was way out of whack. Try it like that. And see if that will be any better. So I pushed it back, no, because it keeps hitting. I try to install it, it keeps moving itself. That's what the problem is. Yeah, every time I try to install it, it moves itself. It messes the timing up. So, just it. I've got grease on my finger, which is getting over everything. Just it that way. Intentionally move it out so that hopefully, if I install it, it gets pretty close to right. And now it's closer to right. We'll see if it's close enough. Move this out there. So one direction. Nope. Still not. Still not right. Nope. Maybe it was right. This is really starting to get on my nerves here. Um, well, didn't 
didn't quite work. Yeah, something's still a bit funny with that, I think. If you hold it down, it... Oh, of course this broke. I'll have to re-glue that, I guess. Or maybe I will take my vise and drill it and put something into the hole that's not been working very long. So I was going to have to play around with the timing of that. Um, it's probably going to take some time to get that exactly right because um, when you put it in, whatever, it hits against any number of things which knock it out of uh, whatever alignment you've set. Um, also, this put a one there, which was not supposed to happen, so I'll look into that as well. Um, could be because these are you know, not perfectly aligned, so might have gotten in line somehow with one of the uh, carry pins. So I'll have to take a look at that. Um, might be the issue there. Um, but yeah, so it's it's close. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Let's see if this will clear. That clears. That clears. That's nice at least, but yeah. I'm gonna take some uh, playing around to get that timing exactly right, and like I said, I have to refix this stupid thing again. Um, so yeah, this is going to be some more off-camera playing, I think. I'm not going to um, mess with this anymore until I get this timed right, and then we'll have to install this piece on the bottom, and then... Um, I don't know why I was trying to install this shaft, actually, because I still have to put all of these pieces on it yet. These are the uh, intermediate gears. Um, and clean them up so you can actually tell that they're steel now before they were some kind of uh, dark black color. Um, these all have to go on that shaft in, you know, in that position all the way over. So I don't know why I was trying to get this all the way installed because it's not even how to put those on yet. So after that, clean up and install the um, input register, but um, I think we're getting somewhere, but so I have uh, quite a ways to go yet, so. Alright, so I'm making some progress here. Uh, you can see I've got the uh, register, the input register reinstalled, not really register, but the input display. Um, I don't really call it a register because technically the storage isn't here, it's actually in the pin wheel, but it doesn't really matter, whatever you want to call it. It's installed. Um, the lever, which is in this position, I'm not sure if you can really see it uh, down there. Um, I had to flip that around because um, it was in wrong and wouldn't fit it right, so I just flipped that around, so that's good. Um, so, let's try it out. Do one, two, three, all right, four, Six and then seven, eight, nine, nine, eight, seven, and then six, five, four, and then three. And that is correct. Two to three zero. So this should clear. Yes, this should clear. And this should clear. Alright, perfect. And this should and we have to that should slide over smoothly. It was a little bit sticky before, but it should I think it's partially because this is uh, still loose here, and the reason for that is um, the hole down here just worn out. Actually, my glue might have failed again. I'm still a bit wiggly. Not sure. Um, but the main reason is the the uh, hole down here for the pin is just uh, worn out, um, so it doesn't lock exactly in one single position. There's a bit of play there, which is unfortunate. But you know, it's just wear on the machine. Um, I suppose if you really wanted to, you could try and weld that up and then re-drill it, but um, we're not going to worry about it. Hopefully it won't be too annoying to deal with that, but 
Um, anyway, um, yeah, that looks good. Uh, we can try, if we add one and then we do reverse. That's not working. Why is that not working? Let's try that again. Do one and then do reverse. Now it works in the bell rings and if we go the other way, wrong way, if we go the other way, yeah, um, the bell didn't ring again because I have to uh, adjust the spring that goes on the um, that piece that actuates the bell clapper. Uh, I think there's just not enough tension there and that's why it's not resetting. So I have that out now, I have to adjust that. Um, so that's why I didn't reset and ring the bell. But something is, is that being like that? I think what's happening, and I thought I had adjusted it to make it work right, but apparently not. Um, as I, whoops, I had taken the carriage back off. What I think is happening is, um, if you remember the counter carry drum down here, um, the first part of the drum, the um, carry, um, these little fingers here are fixed, and in the second part, they're free for the length of Monroe, and then they um, you know, trail behind either direction. What I think is happening, which, which was happening before, and I thought I fixed it, is the trailing part doesn't have enough drag on it to trail behind, and sometimes it gets ahead of where it's supposed to be and causes that to jam. So let's see if we go really slow. I'm still going to do it. Can't really see from here, but I think that's what. See, so, you now I went back and did it, and now it went. So I think that's what's causing it. Um, what I did so that I thought fixed it was, uh, I don't know if you remember, but in between the pieces on the floating part, they had these little brass or copper washers that were keyed to the shaft that would, um, you know, kind of add some drag there to, so that when one part of the piece started turning, the other piece wouldn't automatically start. It wouldn't start turning until the pin hit it and drug it along. Um, when I put this back together, I ended up with some extra ones, I thought, so I just put them on the end, but actually they were missing in between um, one of the sections that wouldn't come off. Um, I, and I'm just explaining this, I can't really show it because of where it is in the machine, you can't really see it now. Um, but the, um, at the very end of the fixed section, the reset finger, which would be akin to these um, lumps here that push the carry reset back into this, uh, non-trip position, that piece is free floating before the actual finger piece is free floating. And I didn't know that there were supposed to be washers in between that, so I, those extra ones actually went in there. And I thought that fixed it, but apparently not, so I have to look back into that. And that time it worked just fine. That worked just fine. So, I don't know. Um, might be something else to look into, but either way, you can see this steps nicely. Whereas if you push it in and then you can drag it wherever you want it. Um, that seems fine. Um, see if this will, no, now it works just fine. So it's all just luck of the draw, I guess, where you uh, set the crank and you come to the end. So definitely looking pretty good. Uh, like I said, a few things to look into yet. Um, being Main thing being that I want that to be accurate every time. Um, yeah, everything else seems to work. Uh, it calculates accurately. Um, I can try a little multiplication here. Let's do uh, 25. So if I read the input register correctly, 25, and then let's do five. So stop it. Yep, and there we go. 25 times 25 is 625. So that's good. And this um, is a little bit stiff on the crank handle because um, you're pushing these in and there's all that spring tension on 
So basically how this works is you can see there's these two little uh, cams here with those little fingers that ride on them. So right now the fingers are in a divot on the cam and when the shaft rotates the cam pushes that out and when it does that you can see this piece down here moving that will push in and that pushes that bar in to release the detents on all the input fingers. Um, so because there's so much spring tension on that, which again, maybe because I didn't use the right springs, not really sure, it's a little bit stiff on this crank, but um, clears out just fine and it releases the det it seems to release the detents fine. So uh, I'm not really gonna worry about it. I think it'll be okay. Um, definitely works okay. So I'm gonna take a second to look at that. And other than that, really, I think it's mostly just putting the uh, covers back on. Um, and then hopefully we can do a full demonstration of this and hopefully everything will be uh, working. Um, definitely working a lot better than what we ended up with. You know, when we first got this, you could barely even move the carriage. Um, you could barely even set the inputs. And those are now pretty good. Some of them are a little stiff. Like I said, I might not have uh, adjusted some of these springs. Some of these springs I think have a little bit, a little bit more tension on than they should, but you can still adjust it. It's just um, not maybe not as pleasant as it could be, but it works fine. So we're not going to worry about it too much. Um, yeah, let me get uh, finished. Uh, I think this part should be fine to put back together. The only real issue that I'm aware of, anyway is down here in the carriage. So if we have to take the carriage back off, I think we should be able to do that without taking this off, hopefully. And I still have to clean up these digits. I got oil all over them, so. Uh, yeah, so far pretty satisfied. Definitely not better than uh, when we started. All right, so as you can see, um, we got everything all back together here. I think there's maybe one or two cases we have to put in yet, but uh, let's do our final demonstration here. Hopefully, um, everything's gonna work anyway. So we can do I said these aren't going to line up exactly perfectly because of the play here in the uh, crank channel. Not really anything we can do about that aside from, you know, um, trying to make the hole in the end here smaller, which is not something we're about to do. Um, so that is correct, the zero. A little bit stiffer than I'd like, but and this is because of the um, springs I put in, but it is usable. Just maybe not as smooth as it was when new, but it does work. Um, multiplication, let's do. And these are easily movable. 625. So we want to do 5 here. And then 2. And then 6. Uh, 365, that is correct. Uh, so, we can do a division. So for division, I'll move this all the way over. You just push that in and move it over. And this side slides super smoothly now. You know, when we first got this, you uh, could barely even move that. E55. Oops, how did I get 555? Let's try that again. 355. Oh, too far over. That's why I just ended the 55. That's interesting that I see go that far over. Kind of funny. Let's try it out. There we go, 355. So I just had this carriage moved over so far that it was off the end of the thing there. Very interesting. But I guess uh, some of the pillow machines are that way as well. So anyway, 355 divided by 1. 
three. Yep. Change this to division mode. Um, that's cleared out. So now we can subtract. It all works. Sometimes I have to go um, to, um, you know, be tone strokes because um, sometimes when I hear the bell, I've already started the second stroke. Um, and I mean, you could pull this back to release the ratchet, but I'll just prefer to finish the cycle and then start the other cycle. Um, when you go to this ratchet, um, this is the end of the ratchet here. So when you start going one direction, you can't go backwards until you finish the cycle or until you release that ratchet. But uh, anyway, I think we are ready to continue here. Okay. That should be a five, three point one four one five nine two nine. I wonder if maybe I, um, because an increments this digit at the very beginning of the cycle. So maybe if I started a cycle and didn't complete it, that might have ha what you know what happened there. Let's try it again. Anyway, go one over. Try again. Three fifty. Divided by one, one, three. Now it's right, so I must have just done something wrong that first time. There we go, 3.14. One five nine two nine. That is correct. So, like I said, I want to just you know maybe went a little bit past the start of the next cycle that pushed that digit one position additionally forward. Um, because if the calculator was actually calculating wrong, then all the digits would have been wrong, not just that one, and then picked up correctly afterwards. Um, so uh, that's my theory anyway. Um, seems to work fine, so I'm not going to worry too much about it. And that actually moves kind of smoothly there. So. Um, because you know, this was getting stuck sometimes before, but yeah. Anyway, um, we am pretty satisfied with this. And that could be a little bit smoother, but you know, uh, it is what it is. Definitely a lot better, you know, than it was when we got it. I'm just wiping some funny oil off my hands. You know, whenever you play with these machines, you're bound to get oil on your fingers. But anyway, um, I'm just gonna grab it for this one. Um, definitely a lot better than it was when we got it. Uh, everything seems to work. You know, again, maybe some pieces could be a little bit better, probably, again, because I didn't use the right springs in here, or I didn't get them adjusted exactly like they should be. But it is usable, it does work. Um, so, yeah. And as far as the um, issue with this piece here, something's getting jammed on the... Um, it seems like if you give it a nice stiff crank, it works, so um, I'm not going to worry about that unless I encounter another issue, but as you saw, it just worked perfectly smoothly there, so I'm going to call that good. Um, so yeah, I think that's about it for this one. Um, 
Hope you enjoyed this uh, very deep look into the inner workings of a pinwheel calculator. Um, definitely this is the furthest I've ever taken one of these apart. Um, so it's pretty nice to, pretty cool to see how, you know, it's one thing to know how something works and it's another thing to actually see it work. Um, and actually see, you know, all the parts because usually you can't see, you know, inside the pinwheel cylinder. But anyway, I thought it was interesting, so I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for watching.